You don't have to look far beyond the bright lights to find the dark side of the city. I'm a private eye and I earn my living in these shadows, drifting from case to case. Last week, it was hotter than Hades. I was sitting in my office drinking a glass of whiskey and wishing for rain. There had been lightning the night before but no rain, and the heat had continued to build. No one would be sleeping tonight. Tempers would be simmering. Sirens rose in the distance as I took a long and slow drink. I was thinking how much better the drink would be with ice when I saw a silhouette appear on the other side of the glass panel of my office door. The silhouette didn't knock. It turned the handle and walked right in. I had been about to have another drink, but I put the glass down on my desk. As a professional, I believed in making a good first impression. The woman who was now standing in my office did not look impressed, though. I figured that I'd better try harder. I'm Granger, I said. Tom Granger, private eye. I followed this with my best world-weary smile, and then asked, How can I help? She looked like she was thinking, like maybe she was regretting walking into my office and was about to leave. My charm must have worked though, because she did not walk out. Instead, she looked me in the eye and said, I want you to find my husband. I nodded sympathetically and asked her to take a seat. I took out a notebook and a pen. I had been a policeman once, a long time before, and some habits clung on. I turned to a fresh page and held the pen over it. When was the last time you saw your husband? I said. The day before last, she replied. It was in the chapel of rest in his coffin a few hours before he was buried. I put the pen down. I had tracked down missing husbands before for clients, but they had all been very much alive. Keeping a poker face, I asked, Can you tell me how he went missing? No, she managed to say before she started to cry. I gave her time. I sat and looked at her, and when that started to feel uncomfortable, I looked at the almost empty glass of whiskey and the bottle by its side. I was about to move on to the spider's web in the corner of the room when she took out a tissue and began to dab at her eyes. I'm sorry, she said. This morning I went to his graveside to refresh the flowers. I was worried the storm would have spoiled the ones that had been left out. But when I got there, there was a hole in the ground and his coffin was broken open and empty. He was gone. It was so horrible. And the people at the cemetery say that they have no idea what happened. And the police are doing nothing. I'm desperate, Mr. Granger. Desperate enough to hire even someone like you. She had been through a traumatic time so I didn't take this personally and told her that I would take the case. An hour later, I was standing beside an empty grave. I ran my flashlight over it. Whoever had done this had trashed the place. The headstone lay on its back in the dirt and was split down the middle. The ground where the coffin had been placed looked like it had been torn open, and the lid of the coffin itself was shattered. The violence of the scene made me shiver despite the heat. I turned away. I didn't have any CSIs to call on to examine the desecrated grave, and the only technology that I had was flickering. I turned the flashlight off to save the failing batteries and I headed back out of the cemetery. I was on the edge of the business district. Office blocks loomed over it. My client had told me that her late husband had worked in one of these buildings. He had been in finance, working 18-hour days, six days a week. I wondered if he had been able to see the graves below from his office window. Wondered if he had ever stopped and thought if there was more to life than just making money. He had been 45 when he had died of a heart attack. Some people would have said that it was a crying shame, 
I wasn't the emotional type. I took out the flask that I had primed with the last of the whiskey from the bottle in my office and I took a drink. It was the dead of night and I had a corpse to find. I put the flask back in my jacket pocket and took out the picture of the missing husband that his widow had given me. The picture had been taken before the coronary, before the mortician had worked his magic so the body could lie in an open casket. He had looked older than his age. His hair was thinning and his face was bloated. His bloodshot eyes shone with stress. And the picture also showed the ring that he wore. It wasn't a wedding band, that was on his other hand. The ring that I was interested in was a substantial piece of gold. It had been in his family since his grandfather's time, according to his widow. They had had no children to hand it down to, and she was set for life once the life insurance policy paperwork had cleared. So she had decided that he should be buried with the ring. I wondered how many other people had known that there were hundreds of dollars lying in that grave, just waiting to be plucked off a cold finger. That was motive enough to break into the grave. But why take the body as well? Working on other cases, I had heard dark rumors of body parts being sold for illegal use in medical procedures. A healthy organ for use in a transplant could change hands for thousands of dollars. Surely the components of a dead body would lose their value quickly though. I replaced the picture, retrieved the flask, and had another drink. I had a whole bunch of questions, but no answers yet. I decided to start looking for the ring first. Tracking down stolen valuables should be more straightforward, and hopefully the ring would lead me to the stiff. I set off walking. I headed away from the business district to an older part of the city where rundown buildings were crammed into narrow streets. The first pawn shop that I saw waited on a corner under a broken street lamp. I was working on the assumption that whoever had stolen the ring would have come to a place like this, where no questions were asked, to get some ready cash. There were bars on the windows and bars on the door. I found a bell and kept my finger on it. A shadowy figure approached. He was gaunt and unshaven. He peered through the door and snarled. What do you want? It wasn't polite, but at least he wasn't brandishing a shotgun in my face. And that had happened to me before around here. I held up the picture. I'm looking for this ring, I said. It was stolen from the man who was wearing it here. The man squinted at the picture through the bars and then said, Oh yeah, that ring was pawned here earlier tonight. It's through the back. Cost you 800 if you want to buy it. A sneer crossed my face and found its way into my voice. I don't buy stolen property, I told him. He scowled. The ring's not hot. How can it be? It was pawned by the man in the picture, and you said that he owned it. I opened my mouth closed it because I couldn't think of a thing to say. In the case, it just got a whole lot stranger. Dead men don't walk into pawn shops and exchange their property for ready cash. Or at least they didn't in the city that I knew. The city of grime and hustling and chasing the dream. The street started to feel as if it was spinning around under my feet. I needed to get a grip to get back to basics. I went with private detective questioning one-on-one -on -one and asked, Well, do you see which way you went? He pointed across the street. I turned to see steps leading down to a basement door. A neon light glowed above the door and the sign which hung over it. I took a deep breath across the street and descended into the bar. The inside of the joint was dark and dank. The smell of things that had gone off a long time ago hung heavy in the air. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could make out shadows hunched over drinks at tables lining one side of the space. The bar ran along the other wall. Rows of bottles on raised shelves behind it cast shapes in the gloom. There was a row of bar stools, but only one was occupied. As I approached the bar, no one was paying me a blind bit of notice. The drinker at the bar had his back to me, and the barman was pouring him a fresh beer. 
In the endless heat of that night, the thought of a long cold beer was mesmerizing. I reached the bar, it was chipped and stained. A fly made its way slowly along the chipped and stained surface. More hovered in the air. I asked for a beer. The barman turned to me. He wore a scruffy waistcoat over a shirt that had been white once upon a time. His eyes narrowed as he said, It's cash only, no cards. My credit rating was in the gutter so that suited me just fine. I placed a couple of bills on the bar. He scooped them up and examined them closely before placing them in the till. And then he poured my beer and slid it over. I raised the glass and I took a drink. It was wonderful. I sighed as I wiped the back of my hand across my lips and said in passing to my fellow drinker at the bar, nothing like a cold beer on a hot night. He looked up from his drink and turned to me. I recoiled in shock because he was covered in flies. They made their way through his thinning hair. They moved across his bloodshot eyes. They crawled over his bloated face and along his lips, which were pursed into a frown. Who are you staring at? He asked in a hoarse voice. A fly emerged from his open mouth as he spoke. I was rarely lost for a smart answer, but all I could do was keep staring at him. But not because of the flies anymore. I was dumbfounded because I knew who he was. I lifted my glass. Slowly because I was shaking so much, I downed my beer. And then I managed to say, I'm a private detective. I'm working for your wife and she hired me to find you. The man who I had recognized from his picture did not look pleased. Perhaps he did not believe in happy endings. Or perhaps being dead was clouding his outlook. And he was dead, I was sure of that. So were the flies which were swarming over him. I took a deep breath and regretted it immediately. The smell of death rising off him made me feel sick. In this heat, he was decaying quickly. As to how a dead man had found his way from the grave to a seedy bar where he was having a beer, I had no idea. So I did what people who feel lost do in bars all over the world night after night. I ordered another drink. Then one for my friend, I told the barman. The dead man laughed bitterly at this. I don't have any friends. I was always too busy working, trying to live the dream and make my fortune. But it turned into a nightmare. I was stressed all the time and I couldn't sleep and I had a pain in my chest for days on end. I thought it was indigestion. He trailed off and he looked into his beer, as if there were answers to be found there. I needed to know more, so to try and get him to talk to me again, I said. Your wife told me you had a heart attack. He kept staring into his glass as he said. That figures. I remember being in agony and then there was nothing, until I heard a thunderclap. It was muffled, but I knew what I had heard as soon as I lay there wondering where I was. It was dark and claustrophobic. I began to panic and I lashed out. I broke through the wood which was over me and then scrambled through the dirt above that. I had no idea that I had been in a coffin six feet underground until I emerged into the open. I was confused and angry and thought that I had been buried alive. Is that why you broke your headstone? I asked. He shook his head. No, that was already split in two. I think it must have been struck by lightning. When he said this, a piece fell into place. I had seen enough old horror movies to know that electrical storms could bring the dead back to life. I had also thought that the living dead were confined to the screen, but the evidence to find that was sipping a beer right next to me. So, what did you do next? I asked. I went for a drink, he replied, or at least I tried to. I didn't have my wallet with me and without cards I couldn't get served. So I pawned my ring off and came here. I was going to just have one drink and then go and find my wife and ask her why she had buried me when I wasn't dead. 
I couldn't look at him for a moment. The flies knew I knew, but he didn't know. I wasn't shy of having awkward conversations, but this was a deuce. I tried to soften the blow and said, Your wife cares about you deeply. All she wants is for you to rest in peace as it should be. He had the glass halfway to his mouth. You mean, he began. I nodded. He was filling in the gaps himself and didn't need me to say anything else. A fly crawled along his hand and onto the brim of his glass. He stared at it and a tear ran down his face. What should I do? He asked. Go back to your grave, I answered. I will help. Yeah, you're right, he said morosely. But before I do, there's one thing that I want. I had the awful feeling that he was going to tell me he wanted to see his wife one last time. I imagined her repulsed reaction. But it turned out that I was worrying about nothing. He rubbed his stomach and said, I'm famished. I would like to get something to eat. I've got a hankering for brains. I knew a 24-hour burger place nearby where everything they served was dripping with grease and it was best to not think about what was in the patties. But I doubted even they served brains as a part of the mix. Eh, food needs to wait, I told him. It'll be light soon. Let's get you back to the graveyard. We finished our drinks and left the bar, and then I walked with a zombie through the last of the night. The heat was intense. The world around us felt as if it was at a breaking point. As we neared the cemetery, a rumble sounded in the distance. The storm was close. I was no longer hoping for rain to take the sting out of the heat. Rain would turn the open grave into a quagmire and I couldn't see the zombie descending willingly into that. Better that the ground was dry. We reached the graveyard side by side. As we did, a lightning bolt flashed through the sky. The grave that the zombie had climbed out of was revealed in its flare. There was still no sign of rain as the storm began to rage, but there was another bolt of lightning. It struck the next grave along. I was left reeling. The zombie was still. Its attention seemed focused on the grave that had been struck. I saw that the headstone had been split in two and I thought, No! My heart began to race. The sweat coating my skin turned ice cold, and I swore that I could hear movement underground. Something scrabbling, digging. I took out my flashlight and turned the beam towards the earth. The surface of the grave moved. A sliver of pale white appeared. My guts tightened as I realized that I was licking at bone. It was visible through the flesh of a hand which had decayed and shriveled away in swaths. The hand was reaching up, clawing at the air, and now a second hand was coming into view. And ahead, a pair of rotting eyes peered out, followed by the stump of a nose and a mouth. The lips had been stripped away and the zombie's teeth were exposed to the night. Teeth that smiled. Now I swear on all that is good that the living dead creature grinned before pushing itself free of the ground to stand on its feet. It had been buried in a suit and the remnants of skin and muscle. Bugs that had been rudely disturbed while they were feeding scurried over the reanimated corpse. I wanted to run, I wanted to scream, but I was gripped by fear and all I could do was stand there and stare as the zombie began to stagger towards us. Its mouth was moving. It was trying to speak, but its vocal cords must have been eaten away because its entreaties were lost in the stagnant air. The storm had passed without a drop of rain, but the lightning had been devastating. It had brought another dead man from his grave. The dead man who I had been hired to find turned to me and said, Are you armed? I was licensed to carry and I nodded. And then you need to put a bullet in that thing's brain. It's the only way to stop it. Bio rising into my throat and my hand shaking, I fired. One dead man staggered backwards and fell to the ground. 
his skull shattered, his brain decimated. Another dead man looked at me. I saw a glint of the living man that he had once been. And now me, he said. I was horrified. I can't, I said. You're not like that thing. You have a widow who loves you. You can still think, still feel. He shook his head and said in a quiet and steady voice, As time passes and my flesh and my reason are corrupted, I too will be driven to attack and feed on the living. I can sense it now, I can feel it starting to happen already. But it can't come to that. I can't allow it. You can't allow it. Please. I knew that he was right. Knew that there was no other way. I'm sorry, I said, and I did what he asked. And then I reburied him and his kin. Dawn broke over the city as I walked away. An almost full moon lingered in the sky, and the dead were in their graves. The case was almost closed. The only loose end was the grieving widow. I couldn't tell her the truth. It was too painful, too raw. She had left her address with me when she had hired me. She lived in a nice district. I caught the subway out of there and over iced tea explained that her husband's body had been taken by the modern day equivalent of Burke and Hare. I told her that the body snatchers had not damaged her beloved remains because I had got there just in time. I made myself sound like quite the hero. That was the biggest lie of all. After I had spun my tail to soften the blow, I said goodbye to the widow and I stepped back out onto the street. The heat from the sidewalk stung the sole of my feet where my shoe leather was worn thin. I wiped the sweat from my brow and felt fresher for all of a second before my skin was clammy again. This was not a day to be out on the street, so the sooner that I was back in my office, the better. I would have a siesta there and hope once more for rain. I arrived at my office just before noon. I had picked up a tuna melt from the deli on the corner. It sagged in my hand when I took it out of the wrapper, and I ended up dropping it in the trash. Not eating was bad for my health, but I couldn't afford to live a long life anyway. Pension plans are for people who work a 9 to 5. Not deadbeat private eyes who feel their eyelids growing heavy in the middle of the day and can't think of a single good reason why they should stay awake. I was drifting off when I heard somebody knock on my office door. I told them to come in. It was a young man who was dressed like he was already middle-aged. He wore a checkered shirt and braces, a bow tie, brown slacks and brown loafers with tassels around the edge. A pair of tortoiseshell framed glasses hung from a chain around his neck. He smiled at me nervously and said, My name is Peter Van Marchant. I need your help. I recognized the name. The Van Marchants were one of the city's dynasties. The great-grandfather had made a fortune on the stock market and the family had ridden the financial waves ever since. I remembered seeing a picture in the society pages of a Sunday paper of the wedding of the youngest Van Marchant and his blushing bride. That must have been around 18 months ago. I wondered if there was trouble in paradise. Forget the seven-year itch. Things went stale quickly in this city. In my best, reassuring professional tone, I said, Of course, please just tell me how. Well, it's... He began and then started to wring his hands and look around nervously. Could he be worried that I would phone the newspapers and make a cheap buck once he had told me what was wrong? But that wasn't my style. I'm discreet, I told him. Everything you say here stays in this room. He gulped and his bow tie wobbled. Uh, thank you, he said and then blurted out. It's my wife. I think she's having an affair. I nodded sympathetically and asked, what makes you think that? He took out a monogrammed handkerchief and blew his nose before continuing. Last month and the month before, she went out in the early evening and did not come back until dawn. I asked her why, but she wouldn't explain. He started to choke up and held the handkerchief against his lips. 
I gave him a minute and said, I can't promise you that you'll like what I find, but I'll take the case. I think he mumbled. Uh, thank you, through his handkerchief. In cases involving cheating spouses were the pits. My wife had left me a long time ago. Long enough that it should have been ancient history, but some wounds just don't heal. Then Margent had driven into the city. I managed to get my battered car started and followed him to his family home, where I parked across the street and waited. He lived in a mansion with high walls and bristling with security cameras. At one point, a private security car pulled up alongside me, and the wannabe cops inside started to grill me about what I was doing there. I showed them my license and explained that I was working for Mr. Van Marchant. They scowled and drove off, clearly disappointed that they hadn't been able to show me how tough they were. Time passed real slow after this. The air con in my car growled and moved the heat around. I felt my clothes sticking to the cheap fabric of the driver's seat with sweat. I wouldn't take a drink while I was behind the wheel, but I could dream. I was thinking about a bourbon in a tall glass crammed with ice when my mobile pinged. It was Van Margent letting me know that his wife was going out. She appeared moments later, sweeping along the drive through the open security gates. I followed her as the road wound down towards the city. The high-end real estate fell away, and the apartment blocks rose all around us as these streets grew narrower. And then the graffiti began to appear on the facades of buildings, and there were empty lots, cars parked up on corners blasting music, and long stretches of sidewalk where the few passerbys kept their eyes dead ahead. We were in a part of the city where the wealthy did not go. Ahead of me, Mrs. Van Marchant slowed and then pulled up in front of a rundown building. She got out and went inside. I parked further along so I was out of sight and then I climbed out of my car. I felt my nerves tingling as I walked back along the street. I was a tough guy but I wasn't immune to a mugger's blade. I reached the building that she had gone in and realized that I knew where I was. The building used to be a police station back when I was on the force. It had been a tough posting then. Now the station was closed down. Why a rich young woman would be here was a complete mystery to me. I crossed over the street and sneaked a look through a window. A half dozen people were sitting in a circle in an otherwise bare room. It looked to me like a self-help group. The seed of an idea which grew when one of the people, a man on the far side of 50, got to his feet and started to speak. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but from his expression, he was growing emotional. After he had finished and taken a seat, the others nodded and smiled gently at him. And then Mrs. Van Marchant took the floor. In the society pages of the Sunday newspaper, she had been wearing a $20,000 dress. Now she wore a plain t-shirt and jeans. Her hair was in a ponytail. She looked strained as well, like a young woman who was carrying a burden. She finished speaking and there were more displays of support from the group. Then a man wearing a crumpled shirt addressed the group. He kept his backside on his seat while he spoke, so I figured he was leading the session. He seemed to wrap things up and everybody got to their feet and started to file out of the room. I moved away from my vantage point and went back across the street. I wanted to see where she went next. It made sense that she would want to be well off the beaten track to attend a self-help group, but I still did not know where she went until dawn. Maybe she was having an affair with one of the others in the group. I was determined to find out the truth for my client. I waited for her to emerge, but there was no sign of her or of anyone else. Thirty minutes ticked into an hour. Red began to streak through the sky. It would be dark soon, and I did not want to be standing out there all night. I moved around to the entrance of the building and tried the door, 
It gave, and as quietly as I could, I made my way inside. A corridor stretched out in front of me. There was no one in sight, but I could hear a television close by. I took a dozen steps and then paused. There was a half-open door to my left. I crept forwards, peering through it, and I saw the man who had been leading the session. He was slumped in a chair in front of a television. A game show played on the screen. The man's eyes were closed and he was snoring gently. I crept on. The corridor split. One way led to what looked like some old offices. The police work which had taken place here would have generated a lot of paperwork and there were always phone calls to be made. The officers who had been based here would have been crammed into those offices. There was no sight of anyone from the self-help group there now though. I returned to the junction and headed the other way to find a row of old holding cells. These were where the perps would be put while they were booked. The front of each cell was still lined with bars and an old-fashioned lock, secure entry. I had seen plenty of setups like this years ago, but right there, right then, I was staring in shock at what I was seeing. Every cell was closed and occupied by a member of the self-help group. Small windows in the external walls cast what was left of the daylight into the cells as I stared at the people imprisoned within. They all sat with their knees hunched up and their eyes looking down. None of them had noticed me yet, which gave me breathing space to try and work out what was going on. Why were they being imprisoned? Was it to do with the problems that had brought them here? Questions raced through my mind and no answers came. I crept past the cells until I reached the last one, where Mrs. Van Marchen sat. She must have heard my footsteps because she looked suddenly up. Her face was streaked with tears. She gasped when she saw me and shot to her feet. Oh, what are you doing here? She asked. I told her. I'm a private eye. Your husband hired me because he was worried about you. But we can talk about that later. First, I'm going to free you. Her eyes were wide with fear. I thought it was because she was incarcerated. I thought that I was doing the right thing. I carried a set of skeleton keys, every self-respecting private I did, and was about to get to work on the lock to the cell door when Mrs. Van Marchen said, No! I looked up at her. I'm not being held prisoner, she went on. I'm here by choice, we all are. I don't understand, I said. As I spoke, the now full moon drifted into view through the window. I only noticed it through the corner of my eye and would have thought no more of it, but she span around and stared out at the radiant disc. And then a spasm passed through her entire body and she fell to her knees. She started to shake as if she was having a fit, and then she threw her head back and howled. It was a harsh, primal scream. As she cried out, the fabric of the back of her t-shirt began to split, accompanied by hideous cracking sounds. I had heard bones breaking before, and that was what that sickening noise made me think of. Through the tear in her clothes, I could see her back expanding and thick dark hairs emerging from her flesh. She howled once more and rose slowly to her feet. She stood now on long, fur-covered limbs, the joints of which extended backwards. She turned slowly and looked at me, and she was no longer human. Dark eyes blazed in the face of a wolf. A snarl escaped from her lips. I swore under my breath and staggered backwards. I felt like I had just walked into a nightmare, or the natural had been twisted into the grotesque. A snarl drifted from another cell. I turned and looked, dreading what I might see. Another lupine face stared out at me. Where there had been a man moments before, there was now a beast. I stumbled on past the cells, all of which now held one of the creatures. They were in a frenzy and were howling and throwing themselves at the bars. If they escaped, I would be ripped to shreds. I ran from the corridor in terror and almost collided with the man who had been leading the group.
He stood outside of his room, the television still playing inside. Who are you? He demanded. A private eye on a case. I snapped back and threw a question of my own his way. What the heck is going on here? He replied. Werewolves Anonymous. I looked at him dumbfounded, shocked into silence by the strangeness of what I had just learned. He said that he needed to check on the group and left me standing there when he headed into the direction of the cells. I could still hear the creatures howling and each cry made me shudder. After what felt like a very long time, he returned. They're even more worked up than usual at this stage of the lunar cycle, but you don't seem to have done any harm. My pleasure. I muttered bitterly. Now, are you going to explain what you mean by Werewolves Anonymous? I will, he replied patiently, but on the condition of complete confidentiality. I won't breathe a word, I told him. He nodded and said, The people who come here have been infected by the bite of a werewolf. At the full moon, they transform into the beings that you saw. In this state, they have no control over themselves and are capable of terrible acts of violence. So they come here voluntarily and after our meeting, the group members enter a cell and I lock them in. At dawn, once the influence of the moon has waned, I let them out and they go back to their everyday lives. Another mystery was explained. Another case almost closed. With his permission, I waited until dawn and met up with Mrs. Van Marchant. She looked tired and was wearing a change of clothes. She asked me to walk with her to her car after I had explained who I was and why I was there. And do you understand why I haven't told my husband? She asked as she unlocked the car door. I told her that I did and then added, um, But I think it's time for the truth. He clearly loves you and the thought you're having an affair is tearing him apart. She stood with her car keys in her hand, looking into the distance. Considering my words, finally she said, I will, but it would help if you were there with me. You can tell him what you saw if need be, so he knows that I'm being straight with him. I agreed and went back to my car for the drive to the mansion. When we arrived, the gates to the driveway swung open. As I followed her through, I half expected the gates to slam shut on me. I was the definition of undesirable to the privileged delete, and they only turned to me when their lives were tainted by the dark side of the city, by crime, betrayal, or in this case, by lycanthropy. My beaten up car made it to the end of the driveway without anybody pressing a panic button and I parked up behind Mrs. Van Marchant and then followed her inside. The mansion's interior was grand but faded. Oil paintings hung from the walls underneath a vast chandelier, but I could see layers of dust on their surfaces. Mrs. Van Marchant led me up a spiraling staircase and told me, My husband and I live on the second floor. I had not seen signs of anybody else in this house as we had ascended the stairs, and I wondered if they lived here alone. When we reached the second floor landing, Mrs. Van Marchant asked me to wait in a lounge while she went to see her husband in his study. I took a seat on a sofa that must have been easily worth more than the entire contents of my office, and I tried to relax. The house was silent and still. That didn't feel right to me, I just couldn't put my finger on why. I was still wondering when Mrs. Van Marchant and her husband came through to the lounge. They both looked like they had been crying and they were holding hands. I figured the truth was out there and now that they could deal with it together. I could also ask for my fee to be settled and get back to my office. After a detour to pick up a bottle of scotch to enjoy at my leisure while I was waiting for my next client. It turned out, though, that the Van Marchants had other ideas. They settled on another sofa opposite me. They were still holding hands and in a way that wasn't just affectionate. I got the feeling that they were giving each other courage. Mr. Van Marchant cleared his throat and glanced nervously at his wife. 
I saw her give his hand an extra squeeze before he said, We would like to thank you for the work you've done for us. Our position in society makes it hard to find somebody who we can genuinely trust, but I can honestly say that we now know we can trust you. He cleared his throat again. While I was wondering if I should double my fee in light of me being such a virtuous knight in shining armor and all, and then he went on. So, we would like to hire you to do another job for us, Mr. Granger. It's unusual to say the least. It concerns a family mystery, one that has cast an increasing shadow over my life in recent years, and the life of my beloved wife since she moved into this house. As you know, we only occupy this floor and since my parents passed away, we are here alone. It's all because of the room on the ground floor. It used to be my great-grandfather's office. It's been locked since his death 75 years ago, and the terms of his will state that nobody can enter. But there's someone in there or something. I've heard it moving around. We want you to go into the room and find out what is in there. We want to know the truth. After hearing him out, I named a prize for taking on this new work. It was high, high enough for me to buy a sofa as nice as the one that I was sitting on, but not high enough to buy a new office that was big enough to put it in. He accepted without a second thought and handed over a key. We'll wait here, he said, and his wife rested her head on his shoulder. I left them and went to see what waited for me in the large room on the ground floor. The room was on the far side of a dark passageway. Wooden shutters over the windows were closed against the light of the day and even though I knew it was still swalteringly hot outside, I felt a chill against my skin as I approached the door. It looked substantial and secure. I put the key in the lock. My hand trembled. I told myself that was because I needed a drink but the truth was, my guts were screaming at me to leave the door locked and to walk away. There are plenty of other cases out there for me, but I had taken this one and I had to see it through. That was how I lived my life, and as flawed as it was, I did not know any other way. The key was stiff in the lock. If what my clients had told me was true, the lock had not been turned in three quarters of a century, and it did not want to give now. I kept trying to turn the key and still the lock resisted. Finally, there was a sharp click and the lock moved. I gripped the door handle and turned it to the right. The door was heavy and stiff on its hinges, so I had to push hard. It moved slowly, creaking and groaning in protest at being disturbed after all these years. And then finally, the door was open enough for me to squeeze through. Feeling like an intruder, I slipped into the room. The first thing I noticed was that the air was thick with dust, so thick that I could taste it. I could hardly see a thing either. There were faint glimpses of light through slight gaps in the window shutters in here, but it was not enough. I took out my flashlight and I clicked it on, and I gasped in shock. The floor was covered in money. There were stacks of coins with notes scattered all around them. I leaned forward to see better. The notes were faded and curling at the edges with age and of different values. I guess there was at least $10,000 just in paper money, within a few feet of where I was standing. I played the beam of the flashlight along the floor in a straight line, and then in an arc and saw that the covering of money was unbroken. Was this why the great-grandfather had wanted the room locked? to keep this horde away from prying eyes. I knew how money could warp the mind and make people do extreme things, but I had never experienced anything as bizarre as this. I moved forwards, hoping that a clearer explanation would present itself. I stepped on coins and notes. There was no way that I could not. I noticed bugs as well, scurrying along the floor. As my progress disturbed the money if they had been skulking under. I had taken a dozen hesitant steps when something new caught my eye. 
I paused and knelt down and swore under my breath. Nestled among the currency was a diamond. It was cut expertly and even under a layer of dust, I could make out the clarity of the stone. I picked it up and turned it around in my fingers. As I was returning it to its resting place, I glimpsed more diamonds among the cash, and gold bars and necklaces studded with jewels. By now, I knew the value of the contents of this room must go beyond the thousands. There must have been millions here. I thought of Mr. and Mrs. Van Marchant upstairs. For all their problems, they were blissfully ignorant of the fortune here. They were already wealthy, but I figured that they would want to get the contents of the room taken to bank strong rooms and counted as soon as possible. As for me, I admit that I was tempted to pocket some cash and a couple of diamonds, but my conscience won out. Taking anything would have made me a thief, and that was a line that I was not going to cross. I turned and was about to retrace my steps so that I could get out of there and go share the news with my clients, when I heard a noise in the darkness. It was to my left, whatever it was. Maybe it was a rat, or maybe something bigger. I heard it again. It was a shuffling, scraping sound as if something was dragging itself across the floor and disturbing the fortune littered there. I swung the flashlight towards the source of the noise. The breath was knocked from my body at the horror which stood before me. It could have been human once, a man just like me, but now it was hideously emaciated. Its flesh was drawn tight over its body. The sharp lines of its bones protruded beneath ghastly pale skin. Its eyes were sunken cavities that stared at me. Even though I was reeling with terror, I could make out the anger which burnt in that grotesque gaze. And then its mouth moved. Its lips were slivers of flesh and I could see yellowed teeth sunk into shriveled gums beneath. You, it said. The words drifted from its hideous maw in a low and distorted tone. You have come to take my treasures. As it said this, it raised a finger and pointed it at me. Its hand was twisted and long filthy nails spiraled from the tip of each finger. I tried to speak, to beg its mercy, to plead to be able to leave. I did not want its treasures. All I wanted at that moment in time was to live. It took a step forwards. Its feet were gnarled stumps. Its legs were so thin they looked like they might snap at any moment. But it continued towards me this aberration, this nightmare made real. My own limbs were locked by fear. Please, I mumbled. Let me go. I'll lock the door. I'll barricade it. I won't tell anybody what I saw. Please. It paused at my words. Was it going to show mercy? This thought alone was enough to allow me to take a step backwards. My legs felt clumsy and heavy, but now I could move them. And then it spat my words back at me. Let me go, please. As it mocked me, its mouth curled into a malicious smile. You will never leave this place. Others have come here and tried, and their dry bones are testament to their failure. It's time for you to join them. I'll extinguish your pathetic life and then add your corpse to the remains of the other would-be thieves. Any hopes that I might have had that there was a shred of humanity left in this thing had dashed. It stepped forward and reached out for me. I closed my eyes, willed that my end would be quick and that the oblivion that followed would be deep and silent. I felt its fingernails scrape against my skin, felt its fetid breath hot against my face and the sound of an explosion filled the room. No, not an explosion, I realized. It had been a weapon discharging. I opened my eyes. A wound had appeared in the flesh of this thing's face, high in one of its cheeks. It was feeling at this with its nails. And then a second blast sounded. The thing flinched and staggered backwards. Another wound had opened, this time in its forehead. I span round to try and see who was firing. It was Mrs. Van Marchant. She had a revolver in her hand. 
In the open doorway just behind, I could see her husband. She pulled the trigger again and again. Get away from it! She shouted and as she did, I don't know if I can kill that thing with this but it sure as blazes seems to sting it. I glanced back at the hideous being which moments before had been about to kill me. It had withdrawn further into the room it was covering low. It looked to be hurting but life still flowed through its veins. I staggered towards Mrs. Van Margent and passed her. Her husband grabbed my arm and pulled me out of the room. She backed out after me, still firing, and then she slammed the door and leaned against it, breathing heavily. What was that thing? Her husband gasped. I wiped sweat from my face. I thought that I knew now. I had heard legends of people who had been so consumed by greed that they had lost their humanity and been turned into monsters. But those legends had been set in wildernesses a long way from here. Still, this city had darkness enough to hide all shades of evil. I replied, I think your great-grandfather did not die. He became that thing and unless you want another family reunion, I recommend that you brick up this doorway. He looked at his wife, clearly to see what she thought. Mrs. Van Margent nodded and said to him, We'll do more than reinforce the doorway. We'll encase the whole room in concrete and then we'll lock the house up and go away. I think this is a good time to go on that world cruise that we've talked about. What do you say? He smiled and then hesitated. But what about your... he said. And the howling, she finished for him. Don't worry about that. We can take a cage with us. And then they embraced. I left them to it. My work here was done. The sun was still high in the sky as I walked towards my car. I was going to park near my office and find a quiet bar. It was time for a drink.